Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Welcome to our webinar this morning with David Burris. David um, will be talking to us today about seven keys to pandemic proof your relationship. And before we get started, I want to tell you just a little bit about David. Uh, David is a sought after speaker that has taken his messages on healthy relationships, leadership, personal development, and kingdom principles to a wide spectrum of audiences. He is the founder and CEO of David A. Burris Enterprises, which houses such companies as the Passion Summit Relationship Institute, the Kingdom Leadership Academy, and David A. Burris Ministries. David is a board member and active participant of the Kingdom Driven Entrepreneur LLC, which is a Christian-based organization designed to equip Christian leaders to impact the marketplace through entrepreneurship. David is also a best-selling author, and added to his list of accomplishments is um, his authoring The Kingdom Driven Entrepreneur's Guide to Extraordinary Leadership and the Pursuit of Purpose. When asked what fuels his passion, David explains, I have a passion for helping people identify their intellectual genius and for seeing the light come on when they discover a new dimension of themselves that they never knew existed. David hails from Southern California. And without further ado, let's get started. Welcome to the program today, David Burris. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. And I really hope, can you hear me clearly? I wanna make sure that we are clear and you guys can see me clearly. We can see you perfectly. Good. Yep, and we can hear you. Great, 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 great. So thank you so much for this amazing honor. Uh, I have been excited about this conversation all day long. Um, I usually can get about five hours of sleep and I was up at the week. This, this thing woke me up this morning, uh, just in eager anticipation. And so uh, grateful and thankful uh, for you all having me. I'm gonna share some stuff with you today that I think is going to um, really speak volumes to where we are as a as a as a people where we are as a community uh, and how we can navigate this place that we're in called pandemic uh, we're dealing with seven keys to pandemic proof your relationships um, and what we'll discover today is when we look at that word pandemic it is we're not going to look at it from the COVID 19 perspective uh, we're going to look at it from a bit of a different perspective, um, and you'll see what I'm I'm talking about in just a moment. I'm going to share my screen with you guys, uh, so we can kind of dive in and deal with some of these things that um, I believe are plaguing us as as a people. All right, um, and I want you, if you would, uh, I want you to grab something to write with. You're going to want to take a couple notes today. Uh, and hopefully we say something that really piques your interest and helps you move forward to a new place. Again, guys, my name is David Burris. Um, as stated, I, am, I live in Long Beach, California. I am from the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, from a city called Richmond, California. And uh, I'm passionate about two things. I'm passionate about all things relationships and all things leadership, and I found a way to uh, infuse both and kind of deal with both, and so I kind of vacillate between both worlds. And so today I get to I get to speak to both, and I get to empower you in the area of both. And so again, thank you, Tara. Thank you all for having me today. Uh, let's dive in, guys. So we're talking pandemic proof, seven keys for pandemic proofing your relationships. 
uh, seven keys from pan pan pandemic proofing your relationships. And I want to highlight what we will what we will go over today. So here's what we will cover. Um, we won't cover a lot of ground, but I think it'll be weighty what we do cover and, and are both beneficial. Um, we'll be dealing with defining a pandemic in order to really identify what a pandemic, uh, how to pandemic proof our relationships. We have to define what a pandemic is. And so number one, we're gonna define what a pandemic is. Number two, we're gonna look at symptoms of, relation, of a relational uh, pandemic, relational pandemic. And then three, uh, guys, we're gonna look at strategies for, for pandemic proofing uh, our relationship, all right? So strategies for pandemic proofing our relationship. Let's look at a couple of few statistics. And I don't want you to necessarily focus on writing these down, but I wanna get these to you. I wanna show you something uh, just in this moment. Uh, researchers estimate that 41% of all first marriages, 60% of second marriages, guys, 73% of third marriages will end in divorce. 60% of all divorces uh, involve individuals between the ages of 25 and 39. Take a look at this, every 13 seconds, there's one divorce in America. That is 277 divorces per hour, 6,646 per day, 46,523 per week, and a whopping 2,419,196 per year. Guys, in just the US alone, 2,419,000 196 people, couples will divorce. Now, look at this. If both partners have previous marriages, they are 90% more likely to get divorced than if this had been their first marriage. This is alarming. Check it out. 1,385 divorces happened during the time span of one wedding reception. Think about that. So per every five hour wedding reception, there will be 1,300, nearly 1,400 couples that divorce just within the time span of a wedding reception. So while, uh, while some are celebrating their start, 1,385 others are, are, are ending theirs, grieving theirs. This is an alarming statistic. Check it out, almost 50%, 50 uh, nearly 50% of the parents with children who are going through a divorce move into poverty after the divorce. So after the divorce, nearly 50% of those parents move into poverty. So if that's the case, we have to define what is a pandemic? What is a pandemic? Um, again, we're, today our focus isn't, to, we're not looking at COVID-19. There are some relational pandemics that we can look at and really learn from and glean from. Let's define what pandemic is. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. A pandemic is an outbreak of disease. It occurs over a wide geographic area and affects an exceptionally high proportion of the people. I'm sorry, of the population. Let me read that again. It is an outbreak of disease that occurs over a wide geographic area and affects an exceptionally high proportion of the population. A pandemic is of a disease prevalent over a whole country or of the world. A, it, it is a global outbreak of disease. And here's why it becomes a global outbreak. It's, it becomes global because whenever this pandemic hits, there is little to no pre-existing immunity. That is so key. Remember, today we're talking about relational pandemics. And so if I'm looking at these definitions and then I'm looking at relational pandemic and I'm, and I'm, and I'm connecting the two, what I'm discovering is um, whenever there is a relational pandemic, it does not just affect the people in it. That's important to note. Whenever there is relational pandemic, whether we're talking about in the marketplace, in business, uh, at work, uh, in organizations, uh, in, in, in the home, uh, among siblings, among spouses, among uh, mother and daughter, among father and son, 
whatever the dynamic is, wherever there is a relational pandemic, as we're seeing here, it affects, it, it, is, it is a pan, it is a pandemic, which means it affects more than just the two people in it. If you really think about this pandemic we're experiencing, even with COVID-19, um, the whole world is at a standstill. Now, now let, let's, let's look at that even deeper. You and I are meeting right now via Zoom, and neither of us are sick, yet we are being affected by the pandemic. So you don't have to be directly in it to be affected by it. And so if you and I are having a relational pandemic, if we're having a hard time getting on the same page in business, if we're having a hard time getting on the, on the same page in our, in our marriage, uh, if, if we're having a hard time getting on the same page in our partnership, it doesn't just affect us. That word pandemic, as we'll discover later, it, it means across the board. Let's, let's look at the etymological root of that word pandemic. It has a Greek origin. And that word is derived of two words, the word pan. That word pan means pertaining to all, all. And then that word, uh, the, the latter part of the word pandemic derives from the word demotic, which means pertaining to people and division. Look at that, people and division. So a pandemic is all people and division. That's important to note. So whenever we're talking about a pandemic, we can expect two things to be in place, all and division. That's crazy. Which means it doesn't even have to start with me for it to affect me. Because it, it deals with all and and if you really think about it, the reason we're meeting um, the, right now virtually is because all of us have been divided. All of us have been divided. So if we look at even our homes and what goes on in our homes, it is vitally important that we understand that if we let the pandemic, the relational pandemic affect our home, all will be divided. And how can we walk together? How can we, how can we move forward? How can we progress if we're all divided? In fact, there's another word that we must have in our household that is called vision. But whenever there's relational pandemic, a, a relational pandemic in place, we see there's, there's another word called die vision. That means a separation of vision. And so as we're looking at, at, at at, pan, at the pandemic as a whole, and as we're zeroing in on relational pandemic, it is critically important for you to see that if we allow these things to hit our home, that there will be all, uh, it, that, there that all will be affected and we can always expect division. Does that make sense? All right, so let's look at some of, um, Let's look at what that looks like. So, we, we and, and, and again, I wanted to highlight these statistics again because th this is a pandemic. Th this is a pandemic. 41% of all marriages were in the divorce, 60% of, sec of second marriage, 73% 70, of third marriages were in the divorce. Ma'am, sir, that is a pandemic. Every 13 seconds, there's one divorce in America. That is, that is a pandemic. It affects all. And it always points to division. Always. Let's look at some symptoms of, relational of a relational pandemic. Look at this. Unforgiveness, pride, and resentment are all symptoms of, of relational pandemic. And I'm sure that as, I'm, as we're looking at this list, you can, you can point to somewhere on this list and say, I've been here before, or... I've experienced this before. I have been on the receiving end of unforgiveness, on the receiving end of pride, and on the receiving end of resentment. But I've also been unforgiving. I've also been prideful, if I were to be honest. I've also had and harbored some resentment. So it's going to be important for me to really diagnose this if we're going to cure it. Look at the second one. Assumption is a, it, it is, it is a symptom of relational pandemic. When I assume that I know what you meant when you said what you said, or when I assume that I know what that facial expression was when you looked at me that way, that, that speaks to a relational pandemic. 
Oh, there's another one that I, I've been guilty of, miscommunication, relational pandemic. It is, it, is, it is very common for me to misunderstand what you said, watch it, or to filter what you said or to hear what you said through the filter of my own assumptions. Or let's dig that out a little bit deeper, or to filter what you said through the pain of my past. And so you say something to me um, to help me, to correct me, but I hear criticism because in my past, all I heard was criticism. And so there now there's a breakdown of community, there's miscommunication because what you said is not what I've received because I'm filtering it through, through the pain of my past or through the experience of yesterday, experiences of yesterday. Passive aggressiveness is another symptom of relational pandemic. And, and in many cases, it's because I don't know how to communicate how I feel. In other cases, it's because I've communicated what I've felt before and you use my words against me as evidence in the future. And so now I've become passive aggressive because I don't feel like I can talk to you clearly or you don't feel like you can articulate how you feel to me clearly. And so we become passive aggressive. We're, we're talking symptoms of relational of a relational pandemic. What's another symptom of a relational pandemic? Narcissism is another symptom of relational pandemic. Now, this word is being thrown around quite a bit as of late, uh, but but I believe that, they're, that we're, we're using this word a little loosely. I don't think that everybody who's claiming that they're living and dealing with narcissists are. However, it is a it, this is it, this is a thing. It's a thing. So narcissism is a symptom of, of a relational pandemic. And then look at that one, selfishness. Selfishness. I have been, I have been guilty of being selfish. Um, this, this, if you were to be honest, you too, if you were to just be honest, have been guilty of selfishness. And so these are all symptoms. If we look at them, and there's so many more, I just wanted to highlight six of them for you, six symptoms. Of of, uh, of of a relational pandemic, um, but I want to look at some. I want to look at some remedies. Let's take a look at this. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you seven keys for pandemic proofing your relationships, and this is kind of the meat of why we're here. Uh, I'm going to share with you for the next 10 to 15 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for some questions, uh, if you have any. But I want you to get your notepad out. And I want you to take some good notes. Uh, I'm going to give you seven things. I'll give them to you. Then I'll kind of unpack them. Then we'll move on to the next one. Um, but I, I think these will help us. And now keep in mind, I'm not just talking romantic relationships. I'm, I'm talking business relationships. I'm also talking friendships. I'm talking partnerships. I'm talking any, any, this is even, this will even uh, affect us uh, in those areas where we don't even know the people we're dealing with. Um, but, but we're still in some type of relationship with them. All right, you ready to move? Let's go, let's take some notes. Um, number one, I want you to write this down. Um, if I'm going to effectively um, deal with this relational pandemic, and if I'm going to pandemic proof my relationship, num num number, uh, relationships, number one is gonna be vitally important that we establish a culture of immediate reconciliation immediate reconciliation. Remember, one of the things that we talked about before was unforgiveness, it was pride, it was resentment. Um, and, and the way we combat that is we become immediate reconcilers. What that means is I don't wait to forgive you, neither do I wait to apologize. But the moment that the offense happens, I determine in my mind that I, I, I can be upset about it, I can be bothered by it, but I'm not going to let that break our communication because when our communication is broken, we are in now in, we shift from vision to division. Whenever there's a breakdown of communication, whenever we stop talking, um, we give the outside influences clearance to have conversations with our insecurities and with our fears and with our anger 
and with our frustration. And so what I want us to be mindful to do is I want us to establish a culture of immediate reconciliation. That means the moment you forget, uh, the, the moment you offend me, not only do I offend you, but I come to you. Now that doesn't, when, when I say immediate, I may need five, 10, 20 minutes. I may, I may need 30 minutes. But what I'm not willing to do is go two and three days without talking to you. That just leaves an opening for um, outside influences and attack. And so what I want us to really do is I want us to establish a culture of immediate reconciliation. That means that, that we, we don't wait to forgive. We don't wait to reconcile but we move toward each other immediately, juxtapose moving apart from each other. Because the further away I get from you, the further I am able to sense you, number one, um, but number two, the further I'm able to communicate with you. And when we stop talking to each other, we start talking to ourselves and everything else that is not conducive to our healthy relationship. So the first thing I want us to hear and understand is we must establish a culture of immediate reconciliation. Immediate reconciliation. Let's look at number two. Number two is we have to create an environment of vulnerability and transparency. Write that down. We must create an environment. We must create a platform of vulnerability and transparency. It's gonna be vitally important that we do this. And, and the reason why it's vitally important that we do this is because I want to be the best me I can be for you. And I need you to be the best you you can be for me. And if I've got to pretend to be someone else for you, you're not getting me, you're getting my representative. If I've got, if I can't be vulnerable and transparent with you, you're not getting me, you're getting an idea of who I could be, but you're not getting the real me. And so I need us to create an environment of vulnerability and transparency so that we can now begin to see when, when we create a vi an environment of vulnerability and transparency, this is key. We are also creating a platform for intimacy. And whenever we create a platform from int for intimacy, what that does is it removes assumptions. Why, why does, how does it remove assumptions? Because whenever I know you intimately, I realize that when you say what you're saying to me, you're not saying it to be offensive because I know you, because we've been vulnerable with one another. We've been transparent with one another. But if we are complete strangers, I don't know how to detect what you're saying and doing toward me. And that is how division happens. So it's gonna be vitally important that create, we create an environment of vulnerability and transparency so that I can get to know you and you can get to know me so that whenever we do communicate and or when we're not communicating, I know you well enough to know this doesn't mean that we're at odds with one another. Or when you say something to me, I know you well enough to know she or he means well because I know them in a very vulnerable, transparent, and intimate space. So number two, if we're gonna pandemic our relationships, it's gonna be critically important that we create environments of vulnerability and transparency. All right, let's move on to number three. I hope you're writing these down. Number three, look at this. We have to create a culture of extravagance so this is my favorite one, extravagant servitude. That means that I look for opportunities to serve you. And you look, you look for opportunities to serve me. But let's dig this out a little bit deeper. Not only do I look for opportunities to serve you, but extravagant servitude says I create opportunities to serve you. That's key. Now that changes things. That, that really takes some things off the table. Because when I am waking up every day to outserve you, and you are waking up every day to outserve me, um, then um, then we, we live in this you first mentality. And remember, we are reapers of what we sow. So if I were to sow a seed, uh, if I were to sow a grape seed, I can expect a vineyard. 
If I were to sow a cherry seed, I can expect to grow uh, a cherry tree. If I were to sow, uh, sow an orange seed, I can expect to grow an orange tree. If I were to sow a lemon seed, I can expect to grow a lemon tree. If I sow servitude, I can expect to grow and reap servitude. You see how that works. So we have to, one of the ways that we pandemic proof our relationships is we create a culture of extravagant servitude. It means that I wake up every day and ask myself, how can I best lighten their load? Now that's challenging because the pride in me is looking for you to deserve my servitude. It's challenging because the pride in me is looking for you to earn my servitude. But what I'm what I'm seeing here is that I can I can really determine what I reap by determining what I sow. And if I sow servitude, I can reap servitude. I reap a harvest of service. So in many cases, if I'm not seeing it being done first, I've got to sow it so I can reap it. I, I think sometimes we're complaining about what we are to initiate. I'll say that again because I really want you to hear it. And I want you, if you're taking notes, I want you to write that down, highlight it, circle it, do what you have to do. But I want to really drive that home. Sometimes we are complaining about the very thing we are sent to initiate. And we can start initiating by starting to serve. Look at number four. We need to always be defining the relationship from all perspectives. Always, how do we pandemic proof our relationships? We're constantly defining what the relationship is. If we're in business together, we're constantly defining, this is what our relationship is. This is my role, this is your role. Why do we do that? So that we don't cross wires. So that we know, we know exactly where we are to be. I can maximize my momentum and maximize my presence and maximize my efforts and offerings when I know what I am to do and what you are expecting from me. The problem is when we don't articulate what we're doing, when we don't articulate what we need, and we don't articulate what we expect, we, 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 we get everything under the tree and then we spend all of our time complaining about not getting our needs met. And so it's vitally important that you and I learn how to define the relationship from all perspectives. That means it's not just about me, it's about hearing what you desire as well. It's, it's about hearing what you need as well. It's about hearing what, what, what you are going through as well. So if I'm going to pandemic proof it, if you're going to pandemic proof it, we, we've got to be able to hear from each other. Remember, we talked about being vulnerable and transparent. A lot of that has to do with our capacity to hear one another's needs. Let's move on to number four. I hope you guys are taking good notes. Number five, I'm sorry. Number five is if we're going to pandemic proof our relationship, we have to listen to this very close. We have to give the love they desire to receive, not just give the love you have the energy to give. I think this is a game changer. This is key. Um, love isn't love if they don't if this if it's not the love they desire to receive. It can be it can be um, you can do somebody a favor, mm -hmm. but but we can't really classify it as love if that's not what they're looking to receive. Let me give you a prime example. Um, I've been married 17 years. I was raised in a single parent home by an amazingly strong African-American woman. Uh, she's brilliant, she's gifted, she's gentle, she is classy, um, and she taught me how to be all of those things, but she did not and she could not teach me how to be a man. Um, so I had never seen what a husband was supposed to do. And so when I got married, um, because I'd never seen it before, I looked to everybody around me to give me my cues. and so. Um, I noticed that one of my friends, he would every Friday um, stop by the florist on his way home and buy his wife flowers. And he would take her flowers every Friday. Every Friday he would get her flowers and take them to her. Uh, and so because I didn't know what to do, I would stop by the florist every Friday uh, to take flowers to my wife. And I noticed that over a period of time, every Saturday morning, I would have to put the flowers in the vase because they would sit on the counter 
all night. Um, and so Friday I would buy them, Saturday I'd have to put them in the vase. And one day I asked my wife, I said, why is it that I've got to put your flowers in the vase? And she swiftly apologized because she didn't realize she was doing that. And she was grateful for the flowers. She said, I, I, you know, I don't know why I do that. She said, but you know what? Um, come to think of it, um, one of the reasons could be that I just don't like flowers. So what I was doing as a husband was I was trying to Billy D my wife because I didn't I hadn't done the research on her. Um, and I was giving her the type of love that I wanted to give her, the type of love I thought she would want rather than rather than finding out, becoming a student of who she is and giving her the type of love she desired to to receive. And so if we're going to pandemic proof our relationships, we've got to give the love they desire to receive, not just give the love you think they need, not just give the love you assume they need, and especially not just give the love uh, you, that you just have the energy to give. That means that I've got to become now an extravagant lover, not just an extravagant servant, but an extravagant lover as well. Why is it extravagant, Dave? It's extravagant because I've got to go out of my way and sacrifice myself to give this kind of love. That means it may be uneasy, it may be uncomfortable, it may be, um, it may not always uh, be something I desire to do. But if I'm going to pandemic proof my relationship, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to learn how to, to, to give the type of love that they desire to receive which means I've got to now pay attention. I cannot love on autopilot. I've got to become a student of their love language. Number six, look at this. I've got to, if we're gonna pandemic our relationships and I'm giving you seven ways, this is number six, we are almost done. If I'm going to pandemic my relationship, if you're gonna pandemic your relationship, we must learn how to view them through the filter of grace and not through the filter of failure. This is very important. I've got to learn how to view you through the filter of grace, which means, and not through the filter of failure, failure, which means I can't stand you and prop you up against what you did last week. I've got to give you a new grace for today. Now, I don't, my mind is not designed to forget what happened last week. So I remember what happened last week, but I'm not going to hold you to it. I'm not going to prop you up against what you did last week um, and, and, uh, and, and point to you and say, this is who you are. But I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn to view you through the filter of grace, not through the filter of failure. That, now, let's, let's, let's take that even a step further. I'm not going to prop you up against what somebody else did to me to offend me. I'm not going to make you live through someone else's offense. But I am going to I'm going to love you and view you and do life with you and move forward with you based on who you are in this moment. Not based on who you were or what you've done or what someone else has done to me. I've got to learn how to, if I'm going to pandemic proof this thing, learn how to view you. You've got to learn how to view them through the filter of grace and not through the filter of failure. And then finally, number seven, I want you to write this down. Always make sure, ladies and gentlemen, that you value your own values. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy. You're saying, Dave, what do you mean value your own values? What I mean by this is if I'm gonna pandemic proof my relationship, that means I'm not gonna hold you to a greater standard than I hold myself. That means I'm not gonna expect you to be excellent and then me to have do everything. That means I'm not gonna expect you to be loving and me to be standoffish. But if I expect to receive that as a value, I must expect to give it. If we're gonna pandemic proof our relationships, we have to always make sure that we value what we value. Make sure, ma'am, make sure, sir, that you value your own values. Are you holding them to a standard that you're not holding yourself to? We can alleviate a lot of pride. We can alleviate a lot of um, haughtiness and high, mighty, uh, high, high mightiness. If, if we would just, if, did I just make up a word, high mightiness? I just made up a word. I love it though. 
<laughs> we can we can void a lot of haughtiness, a lot of pride, a lot of arrogance if we would just look at ourselves and say, "Am I am I holding them to a standard that I'm not holding myself to?" So you must always make sure you value your own values, whatever you consider a value system and whatever standard you're holding them to, make sure that you're holding yourself to the same standard. Let's recap uh, and then we'll take some questions. Number one, uh, we talk seven keys for pandemic proofing your relationships. Number one, we must establish a culture, look at that spelling, please forgive that, of immediate reconciliation. Number two, we must create an environment of vulnerability and transparency. Number three, we must create a culture of extravagant servitude. Number four, we must always be defining the relationship, not just from my perspective, but from all perspectives. Look at number five. I've got to give the love they desire to receive, not just the love you have the energy to give. Number six, you have to learn how to view them through the filter of grace and not the filter of failure. Number seven, always serve. Ma'am, always make sure that you are valuing your values. Always make sure that you are valuing your values. Uh, we're going to move into some question and answer, but I want you to take out your phone, if you would, and screenshot this page because I want to make sure that we're staying in touch. Um, if, if you have any questions that If you have any questions that are perhaps um, private and you say, Dave, I want to ask a question, but I don't want to ask the question in public, um, you can email me. I'd be happy to receive that question. But I want you to jot this information down. If you're not following me on my social media platforms, I would love to connect with you um, and even further this conversation if we need to. All right. Um, we're going to take some questions now. Um, if you have any questions based on anything we've discussed, I would love to hear from you uh, right now. And I can, Tara, Tara, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, David, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? I can All hear right. you now. Thank you. That was an incredible presentation, and I bet our participants thought that it was going to be a little bit different. They thought it was going to be all about COVID-19, but Absolutely. the reality is, is there are all kinds of other pandemics, which you just so beautifully um, illustrated. I am so impressed by um, the comment that you made about we're complaining about the very thing that we are to initiate. Wow. Wow. It really is true that you reap what you sow. Absolutely. Yeah. So the first question, first question that we have is what is the best way to communicate with someone who struggles with reconciliation? Um, one of the best ways, to, I, there are a couple things, but the first thing um, I would say is really helping them understand, number one, that they, it's okay to feel what they feel. So uh, I think sometimes we want people to discount their feelings and move past that moment, but we're not designed to forget anything. And so um, first thing is let them know it's okay to feel what they feel. I would also advise uh, that person is going to need a safe place to land. And so you have to, if you're going to deal with someone who struggles with reconciliation, you've got to be a safe place for them. They, they're going to have to come out of that at their own pace. And so you can create a point in place of safety for them um, to, to, and, and to let them know, I, be honest and let them know, I realize that this is tough for you. I realize that it's, it's, it's probably challenging for you to trust. It's probably challenging for you to forgive and reconcile, but this is a safe place for you. What I would also say the third piece on your end is um, remember, uh, we, we reap what we sow. We talked about that earlier. And so for you to really exemplify that by exhibiting what that looks like from the start. And so you may need to be the example of what reconciliation is and then have the conversation and let them know, hey, listen, I don't want us to be at odds with each other. 
Um, and so I want to make sure that we are reconciling and reconciling, reconciling as soon as possible. And so walking that out with them, exhibiting that is going to be very key uh, in moving them forward in that point in place of reconciliation. Excellent. So, David, tell us about um, how people, you know, we hear a lot about uh, passive aggressive personality types and about assertive people. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you create balance. Um, you know, passive is on one, one end of the scale, aggressive is on another, and really assertiveness is necessary in order to create great communication. Can you talk a little bit about how people can find that balance for themselves and um, the other person that they may be in a relationship with? Yep. So let's look at the both. Let's look at both ends. We have the passive end, which is I don't want to talk about it. Um, we have the aggressive end, which is not only do I want to talk about it, I want to do something about it. And then there's there's a happy medium. I think the way we navigate that is to always communicate through grace. Always communicate through grace. Um, it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be bothered. But we there must be a grace in how I communicate. What does that mean? That means that there's a tone in which I communicate in. Um, that means there's a timing in which I communicate in. That means if I'm, I'm, if I'm upset, I'm going to wait on the right time and the right tone to communicate what I feel. Um, if I'm dealing with someone who's passive aggressive, I'm going to have to communicate that that it, that it bothers me. But I can even do that by using the right time and the right tone. I've got to be mindful of my words. There are some times when we're trying to communicate with someone when they are emotionally spent or exhausted, and that's not the right time to communicate with them. So we have to be mindful of our timing and our tone, our cho choice of words. What I would also say is, in moments like that, you want to, if you're communicating with someone who is passive aggressive, or even if you are the person who is, you find yourself being a little passive aggressive, um, those types of people we need to, and I can be like that if I were to be quite honest with you. And so what I'm learning how to do is to take extra time to identify what I want to say. I, I just need to take time to identify what I wanna say because I wanna get my point across and I wanna make sure you're clear on what I'm saying. And so let me think it through which means if I'm in relationship with you, I need you to give me the grace to think through what I need to think through. If we were to take a little sidebar here, this is how in many cases, men and women, we, we, there's a breakdown in, in how we communicate because men are very direct, we're very bullet point, and we like to think through what we wanna say, we wanna process. My, my, my sisters, on the other hand, you guys are very, um, very detailed, and in many cases, you like to you like to process audibly, and so you want to process while we're talking, and we want to get a way to think about what we want to say, and so there has to be somewhere where we meet in the middle where we give you the grace to process, but you give us the grace to now hear what you've said. Now let me go to my man cave, think through what you just said, so I can come back and give you the answer you desire, not the answer I'm forced to give in the moment. Wow, that is probably true of so many relationships. Excellent. Um, so we have another question. How do we create cohesiveness and avoid division in a virtual work environment? Mm, I love it. So <clears throat> this is going to be, um, to the person who asked that question, I'm going to challenge you to go beyond work. Um, the way we do that is we tap into our own selves as people. Um, I think sometimes we have this work-life boundary where we show up as workers, as a title, and we forget that we're people. And so one of the ways you break down those barriers is you just become a person. Um, what that looks like is Every other every other week, I just want you to reach out to a couple of people and say, "Hey, this is not this is this has nothing. I don't need anything from you. I'm just checking to see how you're doing." Um, especially with all of this that's going on in the world, we need people who will just check on us. 
And so I want to challenge those of you who are watching this. I want you to every now and then just be a person. So those of you um, who have direct report, direct reports, or those of you who are directly reporting to someone, even those of you who are in leadership laterally, I want you to begin checking on each other and just say, hey, listen, I don't want an email. I don't need anything. I don't need a text. I'm just calling. I'm emailing you. I'm sending you a message to see, are you okay? Um, even in this COVID-19 situation, I just want to make sure you're okay. So one of the ways we break down those barriers is we just tap into our personhood and just really reach out and find out, are you okay? Excellent advice. Touch points. Um, so I have another question here about trust. And I think that you spoke earlier about being vulnerable and transparent as a way to build trust. And so we have a question about how do you um, go about regaining trust after there's been an offense or a breach of trust between two people? Sure. Uh, there are three things that I believe lead to a regaining of trust. Three, there, there are a wide array of things, but three very specific things. Uh, we talked about them earlier, transparency, uh, vulnerability, and time. Those are, those are three things uh, that I think lead to a rebuilding of trust. Transparency, vulnerability, and time. What does it mean to be transparent? It just means that I avail myself to you. Um, vulnerability, I avail myself to you. Now, um, transparently, I avail myself to you in what I say, what I do. Um, vulnerability, I invite you into spaces where I have breached the trust. So, for example, if we're talking about uh, perhaps a husband and a wife where there's been an affair on either part, I've got to be transparent about how I feel. You've got to be transparent about how you feel. You've got to be transparent about what, about what led you to that point in place. But here's the other thing. I've got to be now vulnerable which means I've got to give you access, uh, I've got to give you a deeper level of access to my life than I've ever given you. That may mean you get the passwords to my email address. That may mean you get all the codes to my social media. Um, that may mean I check in with you wh whenever I leave the house. I don't know what that looks like for you, but transparency, vulnerability, giving you access is gonna be key. And then time. You cannot rush someone out of their healing process. Um, it takes time, and trust is gained over time. So it's gained through transparency, it's gained through vulnerability, and it's gained through giving them time to process. Um, even the person who has been the offender needs time. Um, they need time to process how they got to that point of offense. And so they need to be transparent and vulnerable with you about that, but they also need time to heal as well. And as a follow-up to that, is there anything specific we can do to create um, an environment that fosters vulnerability? And, and, I, and I ask that on behalf of folks that have um, had issues with vulnerability in the past. That may not be so easy for some folks. Sure. Yep. One of the ways you can create a culture of vulnerability is create what I call talk time talk time. So what that looks like is um, if it's in the marketplace, if it's at work, talk time looks like, hey, I think we should do lunch next Thursday at 1 p.m. I have some things on my heart that are weighing heavy on me. And there's, there's something between us that I just want to clear up and I want to make sure that we're moving forward. Um, and so here, and, and here's what you do. In the invitation of talk time, you're going to tell them, Here's what's on my heart. I feel like when you said what you said last week in that meeting, I, I felt offended by it. It really bothered me. Um, and so I, and, and I want to make sure that we can clear that up. And so next Thursday at 1, I say we do lunch because I want to know what you meant. Um, if you are in a relationship romantically, talk time looks like, hey, next Thursday at 6 p.m., I want to talk about how I feel like you spend money and you don't ask me about the money being spent. Uh, that bothers me. And so next Thursday at 6 p.m., I would like to meet with you. Why is this? Why is this so important? Because now we're giving them, we're giving them what needs to happen, 
we're giving them a heads up of, hey, this is what I want to talk about. And we're also letting you know, I need you to have some insight on, on this conversation as well. Uh, and so vulnerability, and let them know, I need a very vulnerable, transparent conversation. I don't want anything surfaced. So I want to think, I want you to think through what you feel. Um, and so next week, let's go, let's go have dinner. Let's kind of hang out and let's talk. And I want to find out where you are with this. I want to share with you where I am with it. And I want us to meet somewhere in the middle so that there's no breach in how we function and move together. Excellent. Excellent. So we have um, one of our participants that's going to unmute himself right now. Good day, Maza. Um, it has a question that he's verbally. Good day. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Tara. Um, a comment first. This is a really, really refreshing, unique um, perspective, especially like as an up-and-coming entrepreneur. I think what's missing in a lot of business models is this intentional idea of like coming at people with your relationship first and how to do it in the breakdown. So I really, really appreciate it, Mr. Burris. And for the chamber, I think like if we can get more of these things happening, community will open up widely to this. Um, you know, throwing paychecks at people, grants and monies is a great thing, but this piece is what's missing um from conversation so i really really appreciate what i'm hearing from both perspectives and then for you mr burris uh i'm 100 percent in agreement that like wellness socially you know privately even like professionally is important so could you break down what it sounds like from your perspective on this idea of defining relationships more specifically from the perspective of a professional setting as an up-and-coming entrepreneur how do i navigate those those spaces and those conversations. Hey, that's, that's a great question, man. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you adding value to this conversation too. Um, what that looks like to navigate or to define that relationship. What it looks like is um, so. The day and Dave meet, and we say, I say, hey, man, this is what I'm good at. I, I'm really great with. I'm really great with people. Um, I have a marketing sense. I have a branding sense. Um, I'm, I'm an exceptional visionary. These are the things that I put on the table. Um, and and G'day, I would love to hear what you do. And so you put on the table what your strengths are. And so now we define our relationship based on strengths and weaknesses. We look at it and say, here's the value I add to our relationship. You're saying, well, here's the value I add. And the reason why this is key is because now I can stay in my lane and I don't have to, I don't have to, I can I can work my field. And if you're doing what you do well and I do what I do well, um, we can work together. Here's why it's also key. We can both look and say, okay, this is what we have covered. Now we need someone else who maybe we can pull in to help in this area of, of our of our relationship. So defining that is key. So first of all, we're defining who we are as people. The next thing we want to do today is we want to define now where do we want to see this go? as a unit, as a team in partnership, because if we have two different ideas, again, we have two different visions and there's always division. And so we wanna define not only who we are and what we bring to the table, but we also wanna be looking to define now, based on who you are and who I am, where do we wanna see this go? And we wanna always be defining that. We wanna set some benchmarks. Okay, so by this time next year, I think we should be here. We should have maybe 10 employees. I think we should have, um, uh, this this many partnerships or connections. Um, and so then at that point, we can look and now redefine what does this next phase look like for us? If we're moving in a direction and we don't see any progress, now we step back and redefine, okay, maybe this isn't working. How can we fine tune? And so we always want to be redefining based on who we are and where we want to go. Does that make, I hope that makes sense to you. All right. Thank you, G'day, for that question. Do we have any other questions? My chat box is empty. Looks like we handled some pretty important today, and I think, G'day, your point is very well taken. I think we need more 
communication, more honest and more transparent communication amongst them, our community members, our collaborative partners. So thank you for that uh, very thoughtful point and question. Um, well, I guess if we don't have any more questions coming in, David, do you care to um, leave a parting thought before I close? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, let's see, Miranda says, oh, she just says awesome presentation. Relationships come first, she agrees, and the rest will follow. And she says, thank you, Mr. Burris. All right, shout out to Miranda. Thank you very much for sharing those thoughts with us. Uh, anyone else want to get a quick shout out in the chat before we go? This has been a very fruitful hour. Um, okay, Mr. Burris, closing thoughts. Well, first, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Tanya, for the nod and for allowing me to share with you all. Uh, good day. Thank you for your, your adding value to this conversation, sir. And Miranda, thank you so much for uh, that shout out. Um, to, I just kind of want to leave a thought on the table, and it kind of speaks to what my brother Gaudet did say. Um, in building business, in building partnerships, and building relationships, what I've learned is when you ask for their heart before you ask for their hand, their hand won't be difficult to get. And so um, let's begin looking for the heart connection um, so that when the hand connection comes, I know who I'm reaching out to. All right, so ask for the heart, then ask for the hand, and and, we'll be, and that just really speaks to community. All right, thank you all for, uh, again, thank you for having me today. It has been an absolute pleasure, and I really hope this isn't the last time we cross paths. Yes, David, again, thank you for a wonderful presentation this morning. Thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce and Chamber Foundation, we appreciate membership. We appreciate your support. Uh, check us out on Thursday um, for Finding Your Balance, which is going to be a free yoga experience with our dear member, Corin Stewart. Um, it should be on and cracking um, exercise-wise on Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Um, again, we are nothing without you, our members. We are committed to um, engaging, educating, and empowering you. Our office is not open physically, but we are open virtually at this time. Reach out, 559-441-7929, or reach us at info at fmbcc.com, info at fmbcc.com. Thank you all for attending. Have a wonderful day.